On this week's edition of New York Now, a new approach to vaccine hesitancy as New York's COVID numbers continue to rise. Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio and our own Daryl Camp join me on that and the news of the week. Then, Democrats gear up for next year's elections, including the race for governor. State Democratic Chair Jay Jacobs joins me to discuss. And later, immigration reform has become a key priority for Democrats in Congress. But can they get it done? Congressman Adriano Espaillat and Eddie Tavares from Forward.us share their perspectives. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority and we will take them to court challenging it. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. Just when we thought things were getting back to normal here in New York, COVID-19 has thrown us another curveball. The Delta variant of the virus has spread like wildfire in just the past few weeks. And according to the CDC, it's spreading the quickest in New York City, Long Island, and a few counties upstate. Just for context, the average positivity rate in New York was above 2% this week for the first time since May. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but we're talking about thousands of new cases every day. That being said, it's possible that the latest surge may not be as bad as what we've already seen. And that's because of the COVID-19 vaccine. All three of the vaccines available in the U.S. have been shown to protect people from the variant, or at least prevent life-threatening cases. But in order to be protected, someone has to be vaccinated. And while about 75% of New York adults have gotten the shot, that means more than 3 million people have not and could catch and spread the virus. So the state is now doubling down on the vaccine, setting new mandates for state workers and encouraging the private sector to get involved. Here's Governor Cuomo this week. You can admit vaccinated only people into your establishment. I can argue that it is a smart business practice because I want to go to a safe restaurant and I want to go to a safe theater uh, and I want to go to a safe bar. And uh, I think it's good business for the private sector. I also think it provides a real incentive for people to get the vaccine. But not everyone's happy with those new mandates. And we also got an update on the state's COVID-19 rental assistance program this week. Let's discuss that and more with Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio and our own Daryl Camp. Thank you both for being here. Sure. So we didn't get into too much detail of it before we just heard from the governor, but the governor is mandating that state workers either get the vaccine or get weekly COVID-19 testing. But, and that's become a problem with labor. Karen, what's going that's on? That's right, there? unless you work for a state-run hospital. And right. then you have to get the vaccine essentially or else, I guess, or you're, or you're fired or you can't come right. to work. So um, this is, you know, something that's that New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio did, the state of California is doing, it's becoming a trend. Um, what I wonder though, is people who still don't wanna get vaccinated and have to submit to the tests, that's gonna be cumbersome to implement. So like, does, does your supervisor have to check that every week? Like who is gonna follow up with that? So that seems a little bit messy, but I guess he feels like he can't completely mandate a vaccine at this point for a number of different reasons. First of all, we don't have a state of emergency anymore. The governor right. got rid of that in June and the FDA has not fully approved these vaccines. So legally you can't, you can't mandate it that everybody has to get it. And it brings up a lot of different questions about everything too. Like I don't totally understand what he can do right now and what he can't do. So he, the disaster emergency ended, as you said, mm -hmm. and he lost his some of his emergency powers before the, that ended in uh, in March or April, so I don't know like if he can issue a mask mandate now if if we go back to that or if he can just say the CDC says this and we're going to encourage it but I don't have the power. Yeah, I don't think he has the power for mask mandates. Legally, you can only you, the employer can make these rules, but you can't do them from other people from the state of emergency. Maybe, maybe he got rid of that too easily, even though he was like under such pressure, especially from Republicans to like, you can't control the state this way anymore in retrospect now, you know, maybe he should have hung on to it, right? <laughs> can't win, can't I, win in this situation. So something that he <laughs> does have is money. He has $15 million that he announced this week that is going to go to vaccine acceptance. 
Dara, what is this going to? What is the money actually going to be going towards to boost the vaccination rates? There are basically a group of nonprofits, particularly in the New York City area, that will be reaching out directly to individuals and communities who have not accepted the vaccine, statistically speaking, and saying, hey, let's get educated about this. Here's what it's about. It seems like at this point, though, anything post January that the governor has done has at least partially been a function of politi political expediency. Mm -hmm. So when you have the attorney general about to have another report at some point in the next few months or potentially weeks, you have to look at, okay, is he attempting to turn dirt into rose petals here by some sort of political alchemy? So we have to sort of read too deeply into anything he does at this point. And the money was already in the budget. So it's a question of where in the budget was it and what exactly will the money be used for over time? Yeah. Do right. we need that announcement right now and <clears throat> held down to the money for three or four months? No, <clears throat> right. we didn't need to do that now. So it's the timing right. is curious. Yeah. And we also had this week something interesting. Speaking of the governor, he's obviously under a lot of different investigations, mm -hmm. one of them dealing with sexual harassment, both investigated by the AG and the assembly. Mm -hmm. And we heard something this week. The attorney that handled one of the cases, uh, Charlotte Bennett, when she reported the alleged sexual harassment to the administration, she resigned this week. Karen, what happened yes, there? Yes, that's right. That's one of Cuomo's top lawyers um, resigned. The New York Times reported that. We're wondering if that's some kind of tea leaves reading that maybe she is going to be one of the fall people because she didn't apparently go through the correct procedures when Charlotte Bennett reported what was happening with the governor. She said, well, she allegedly said, well, he was just grooming you for sex, but he didn't sexually harass you. So you don't really have a case, <laughs> which, you know, to anybody's ears does not sound very good at all so no. that's an l morally still yeah mm -hmm. i, I mm -hmm. that does not sound great I, yeah. I was speaking... and and you wonder if that they you know she's seeing that she's going to be you know ripped apart in this upcoming report based on she's been questioned by the attorney general the governor has now been questioned and you know maybe this is time for her to leave so when it comes out they can say oh well she doesn't work here anymore well, we are seeing, as we talked about on last week's show, a shift in strategy from the governor, where as at the start of these investigations, when he was being accused of sexual harassment, he had this very teary response. He said, I'm embarrassed. I apologize if I made anybody uncomfortable. I'm going to change my ways. But he was very careful to say, I did not touch anybody inappropriately. Mm -hmm. Daryl, what do you make of this change in tone in how he's responding to this? That is the political alchemy I was referring to a couple of minutes ago because it's worked. You have people who said he lost the public trust, people like Zelnor Myrie, who said, hey, we can't trust you and we need a different leadership strategy. And he's appearing with him at events. You had uh, Jamal Democrats. Bailey. You have a ton of people, <clears throat> Andrea Stewart Cousins, who could have their own events, but they haven't. So it's been practical on some level. Additionally, last week, Carl Hasty has been getting dragged for about seven days now for what I thought was a moderate response. I understand why some people would be upset by saying, hey, we don't know if it will be actionable if the AG finds some wrongdoing. Mm. But at the same time, it's it's not he's not wrong necessarily, but I understand the emotional response people have. Well, right. Yeah, there, right. There's also mm. a situation where what if the AG's mm. report comes out? And the report says exactly what the governor thinks it's going to say. In, in, well, what he publicly thinks mm -hmm. it's going to say. Well, he says it's <laughs> going to say that. He knows in advance, apparently. That's yeah. what he's been saying lately. People are going to be shocked, it's he said this week, I mean, when they I see think like, you know, how innocent shocked. he is. <laughs> yeah. right? He's also impugning the motives of one of the investigators, um, you know, saying that because this investigator, June Kim, used to work for Preet Bharara, former U.S. attorney, who prosecuted, successfully prosecuted Cuomo's former top aide, Joe Prococo, who's in prison. I know that's convoluted, but according to Cuomo, Preet Bharara actually now wants to be governor, and he's going to somehow control his former deputy, June Kim, who's investigating this. And, you know, June Kim will do a bad report on Cuomo with no basis at all so that Preet Bharara can be governor. And everyone's, that seems to be the governor's defense. Everyone's right? motivations are political except for his. Yeah. That's what yeah. I learned this and week. And the attorney general, mm -hmm. Tish James, he's been saying that with no evidence that she wants to run a for governor. A former ally, by the way. Right. And yeah. he said that the state controller, Tom DiNapoli, also with no evidence, wants to run for governor. So that's the motivation of everyone who's against him. They'll just stop at nothing An to become primary. governor. Oh, yeah. right? and then, but you know, so that resonates with people too. Yeah, so I guess, absolutely. you know, he's thinking the strategy is going to win because 
the public knows me more than they know these other people. Right. Well, we didn't get to it. I wanted to talk about the rental assistance debacle. You can see that on oh, our website goodness, at yeah. nynow.org. We have the full story there. Got to leave it there. Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio, our own Daryl Camp. Thank you both so much. Sure. So while Republicans are already building a ticket for next year's race for governor, Democrats are trying to do the same. But there's a lot of unknowns there, like will Governor Cuomo run for a fourth term and who would replace him if he's not the party's nominee? No one really knows, but Democrats are confident they'll win the race for governor, regardless of who's on the ticket. And they expect that momentum to trickle down to races for Congress and the state legislature. For more on that, I turned this week to Jay Jacobs, the chair of the state Democratic Party. State Democratic Chair Jay Jacobs, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we're here to talk about politics heading into 2022. It's a big year, both for the race for governor and the state legislature. Let's talk about the race for governor first, because I think that's on everybody's minds right now, given that the Republicans are making a lot of noise and we don't really know what's gonna happen with the governor. So in early July, a Siena poll found that about a third of people asked want the governor to run for reelection. It's a startling number. What do you even do with that as head of the state party? Well, remember something, you know, when you ask a question like that, you're not talking about who should run in his place and, you know, who, who else do you want? Um, you know, as, as a candidate goes, you have to run against somebody. And so I'm not that worried about that kind of a poll. I think if the governor gets through his current difficulties, uh, then he's going to be poised um, very well for a reelection campaign if he chooses to run. So I know that you have said that you support the various investigations into him, and I think that we're months away from a decision about will he, won't he run, but if there is a situation where he either is forced out of office or he decides not to run, what do you do then? Do you have a plan B, any names floating around? Well, we have a real strong bench. I mean, there are a lot of quality uh, potential candidates for governor. I, I don't have a worry about that. Um, you know, you just t you turn around and you've got, uh, um, you know, a whole bunch of people that would, would uh, be ready to run for governor if this governor does not. So uh, that's not a, that's not a concern of mine. I think we have to get through this current period to figure out um, you know what the future looks like and then see what the governor wants to do. What do you think goes into that decision as the party? I know obviously we're waiting for reports to come out. We don't know what they're going to say. But at what point does the party say maybe let's go in a different direction? Do you have a point in which that would happen? Well, you know, I, I think that. Um, there's always a point where you've got to look at whether uh, any candidate has a, a winnable race, has a shot to win the election. So that's really the most compelling part of it, I suspect. The other part of it is, you know, we have to look at um, what the actual uh, determination is by these various investigations. And there isn't just one, there have been multiple investigations. It, it turns out that the um, the federal investigation on the nursing home issue, um, uh, 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 they determined they were not going to pursue. Uh, that particular controversy has been put to sleep. Well, let's see what happens with the others. It doesn't indicate what will happen with the rest of them. But we have to take a look at them. And obviously, we want a candidate that's viable. Uh, and viability is based upon the fact that they can get elected. Right, exactly. And I think, like I said, I think we're months away from that decision. And as you also said, I think that you do not have a shortage of people who would like to run for governor if he is not the candidate. But looking at the issues, Republicans are looking at a lot of issues in their race for governor. Their candidate, Lee Zeldin, is really highlighting crime and cost of living. And I know that those are both issues that Democrats are focusing on as well. But what do you see as the top priorities for a candidate for governor? What do you think they should focus on to really get the attention of voters? Well, I think if it's this governor running for re-election, um, I, I think he has an excellent record, and he's done an awful lot that um, I would say to you um, he'll be able to present to the voters in a very positive way. You just have to take a look at what where New York State was, and um, not just fiscally, but even uh, uh, in infrastructure, to see where it was and where it is now. And I will tell you that uh, he's done a great job. And Democrats generally have uh, done an excellent job in you know getting new york to where it is today and, and you know we've had our difficulties with covid and the leadership of the governor has helped us through that in large measure but um you know uh, new york is, is strong um the infrastructure improvements that democrats have made and under this governor's leadership are certainly something we can be proud of we're looking to move us into the future and you know the republicans uh, you know they're in a tough position but they they do make a lot of noise 
and frankly, you know, this nonsense about defund the police and all the other things that they're trying to pin on, you know, mainstream Democrats is is, is a farce. Any any, it's as ridiculous as us trying to pin on Republicans some of the far right nonsense that's uh, you know prevalent in their party. It's just it's just not realistic. So they can do their thing, but the people of New York State are smart. They know what the story is, and they'll be able to see it, and I think they'll make the right choice. So speaking of all of that, that brings me to my last question for you. Obviously, we have the races for the state legislature as well. Back in 2020, we did see a new slate of Democrats that identify as Democratic Socialists join the legislature, mostly in the Assembly, a little bit in the Senate. And that seems to confuse a lot of people because we have a lot of moderates in the legislature. Do you see the Democratic Socialism movement as the future of the Democratic Party, since some think that it's gaining steam? Well, let's take a look at the recent Democratic primary in the city of New York, one of the most progressive places in the country. What happened? 70% of Democratic primary voters, the voters who came out, uh, rejected the DSA, the far left, and the candidates that were endorsed and supported by them. 70% rejected them. So I, I don't think it's the future of the Democratic Party. I think they have a place in the party. I think their voices should be heard. I think their passion and, and, uh, and vision does move us a little bit further to the left than we might normally go, us in the progressive center. And I think that's a good thing. But let's not make the mistake of thinking for a moment that uh, the far left uh, is going to be uh, driving the uh, the, the engine of the Democratic Party in the years to come. Uh, the primary voters of New York City have proved that, uh, notwithstanding the fact that in a couple of districts here and there, which tend to be far left in their constituency, they're going to elect um, far left uh, legislators and the like. That's going to happen. But look at overall where we are in New York State as the Democratic Party. We are a, a center party that's progressive. We've done progressive things. We're going to continue to do that. But we're not running this uh, 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 this car off the cliff. We're just not going to do that. And I think in upstate districts, too, I, I see the viability of a DSA candidate maybe not being so great, especially in competitive districts. But that's something right. that we'll have to watch in the coming years and the next election cycles as either more candidates like that get elected or they don't. But we'll leave it there. State Democratic Chair Jay Jacobs, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So we'll see where all that goes in the next few months. Cuomo's had a primary challenger his last two elections, so it wouldn't be a surprise if that happens again. That's if he decides he's running. In the meantime, immigration reform has become a key issue in Congress this year, with Democrats considering a path to citizenship for certain immigrants. And a few weeks ago, a federal judge put a pause on new applicants to the DACA program, which prevents deportation for those brought to the U.S. as young children. But Congressman Adriano Espaillat, a Democrat from the Bronx in Manhattan, says there's momentum for action on both of those issues. I spoke with him and Eddie Tavares from Forward.us about why they think Congress should get serious about immigration reform and how they could do it. Congressman Espaillat and Eddie Tavares from Forward.us, thank you both so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Of course. So we saw recently a federal judge put the DACA program on hold. This is a program targeted at children of undocumented immigrants that come in when they're very young so they have protected status. So Eddie, I wanna go to you first. What does this mean for immigrants in the US and immigrants in New York? How does this ruling affect them? Yeah, so I mean, we've continued to see how uh, DACA recipients have been left in the limbo in the fight against this very successful program that has bipartisan support and that the American people um, support overwhelmingly. And so how this affects the almost 30,000 DACA recipients is that it continues to leave them in the limbo. The uh, essentially like good news is that folks that are currently under DACA can continue to renew and so until the courts litigate that. We've heard from the White House who uh, already put out a statement prompting that they will uh, appeal this uh, ruling um, and see it all the way through the courts. Um, on, the unfortunate, on the very unfortunate side, besides the fact that DACA once again is in jeopardy, is that the new, new dreamers who would have been eligible to receive DACA, uh, sorry, uh, DACA, and that's about 
almost 80,000 uh, people um, are no longer able to uh, get DACA. And so that keeps them in jeopardy of deportation and continues to keep them in the shadow by not giving them work authorization. And so those are the things that we, that because of this ruling that we're now going to see. And there's one clear you know, solution to this, which is passing a uh, pathway to citizenship for DREAMers, soccer recipients, TBS, and essential workers. So that's a very big issue we'll get to in a second. So Congressman, DACA is a program, if people aren't familiar, that was put in place by the Obama administration without Congress. Do you see any appetite in Congress among Democrats, even among Republicans, to codify DACA into federal law rather than having it sit in this uh, limbo of like executive power? Absolutely. I think DACA is a low-hanging fruit, if you may, within the uh, broader uh, immigration reform uh, debate. And uh, as was said by Eddie, uh, in blue states and in red states, uh, there is an appetite to um, bring some relief for these young people, primarily because uh, people identify with them. They are nurses, and they are teachers, and homeowners, and small business owners. And they are an important part of the fabric of communities across the country. Uh, I think that TPS recipients, um, DACA recipients, uh, uh, essential workers uh, are really low-hanging fruits. They should be uh, extended uh, their, their rights and their benefits almost immediately. But we have an additional 11 million people or so that are undocumented that we must also address. So this opens us up to a wider conversation about a path to citizenship. Eddie, I want to go to you. Supporters of a path to citizenship say that basically people are living here and they need that path just because it provides so many more opportunities for people, so many more services. On the other side of this debate is people saying that there shouldn't be a path to citizenship. It should be easier to immigrate to the U.S. What would you say to those people who have that perspective? So it's, it's it's both, right? It should be there should have a pathway to citizenship for folks that are here, and there should be easier channels for folks to come here if they so choose to, for whatever the reason is. And so we know in the last four years that immigration and migration to the United States have been cut. All legal pathways here have been cut, uh, you know, by instrument like insurmountable you know ways um, and so we can't have it both ways and so what we are asking is a humane dignified ways to ensure that families are reunited and the people that are already here that have contributed contributed to our economy but more importantly to the fabric of our social fabric who are our families uh, neighbors worker colleagues can stay here and so this is not just about the economic impact this is also about the humanity and the community that has already been built by undocumented immigrants for decades congressman what do you say to republicans when they are against this when they talk to you about this obviously you have to go t through reconciliation because in the senate if you don't then republicans could filibuster it if they wanted to what would you say to republicans that just don't want this I say that immigration reform is the best economic development plan that we have. And that, in fact, as we come out of the pandemic, we see, and one of the clear complaints that I hear from people um, across my district and outside of my district is the lack of uh, employees they have for small businesses. But if you're really going to undertake um, a major, let's say, transportation infrastructure, uh, initiative that will provide, you know, millions of jobs. Uh, I think there's going to be a greater need also for additional workers in other areas, right? That will be sort of like left without uh, the labor force that they need to move forward. So uh, the immigration reform debate is, in my opinion, the best economic development plan that we could put together. And really, if you look at American history. Uh, our economy really has never been uh, boosted up to where we want it to be without uh, immigrant labor right next to it. So, you know, that we have no choice in this matter. You know, that brings me to another question for you, Eddie. I feel like when people think of immigration issues, they automatically go to deportation. It's just what people know when they think about immigrants. But there are obviously a lot of other issues that affect the immigrant community, both in the U.S. and in New York. What are some of those issues that people may just not be aware of, especially here in New York? 
Yeah, in, in New York, we have uh, sp more specifically language barriers that really hinders how not just undocumented immigrants, but also uh, immigrants with uh, status here uh, are unable to access certain opportunities, whether that's social or even entrepreneurial. We saw that during the pandemic, during PPEs, a lot of immigrant small businesses could not access those because there was a huge language barrier. And so making sure that New York is proactive about uh, providing these type of uh, accesses, uh, but also making sure that it's more democratized to ensure that it's reaching certain uh, people uh, throughout New York. Uh, the other issue is uh, that I say is um, occupational licensing. Uh, so ensuring that undocumented folks have the ability to uh, apply and get and, and get tested and uh, have licenses. Um, and that could be anywhere from healthcare professionals, from small business uh, plumbers and so on and so forth. So there's currently a bill called the Empire State Licensing Act that would allow this to happen. We've seen this happen in Nevada, New Jersey, and recently, as recently in Colorado as well. So looking for economic opportunities, but also expanding how we interact with our non-English speaking immigrant community is critical for this state um, and its economy. It's a lot to look into, and obviously the issues that are affecting the immigrant community in New York are very expansive and too much to fit into this interview, so we'll leave it there. Eddie Tavares from Forward.us and Congressman Adriano Espaillat, thank you both so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And the issue of immigration reform isn't going away, certainly not in Congress and not here in New York. But we do have to leave it there for this week. Thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET and by the Dominic Ferrioli Foundation.